Okay, so great. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here uh, for this mini course. First of all, Mark for accepting uh, our invitation to deliver the mini course. And thank you everyone uh, online to, to be with us on Zoom. So uh, just a few words to introduce uh, Mark. Mark Ewan is a, uh, an outstanding professor and expert in uh, computational harmonic analysis, mathematics with data science with applications to signal processing. He got his PhD from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and then he did postdoc in the University of Minnesota, Duke University, and he now holds a dual appointment at the Department of Mathematics and Department of Computational Mathematics and uh, uh, Computer Science and Engineering, I believe. Science and Engineering. Science and Engineering, sorry, at Michigan State University. Um, so Mark uh, did a lot of work in uh, compressed sensing, sublinear time algorithms that he will explain to us uh, in these three days, more recently also in the field of high dimensional approximation. So personally, I'm really excited about this mini course. I think we'll learn a lot from Mark. So uh, about the logistics, we'll have two sessions. So the first hour uh, of mini course will be from now to 3 p.m. Then we'll have a quick break, 15 minutes. We'll resume at 3.15 up to 4.15, and then we'll have a Q&A. But you, I think if people want to ask questions before, uh, you can either raise your hand if you're here, or you can virtually raise your hand uh, on Zoom, and uh, you will be able to be, you will be given the opportunity to ask a question live. Uh, yeah, with that, thank you again, Mark, and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I encourage people to ask questions whenever they might arise. Um, I will probably confuse you fairly often, not because what I'm talking about is difficult, but because it's me talking about it. So when that happens, just get the clarification you need and, and uh, we, we should all be able to go on. Uh, so just a little bit more in detail about, the, about what the courses are gonna be about here. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of sort of interdisciplinary approaches for uh, compressive sensing. Uh, so the first uh, couple days are going to be devoted roughly to maybe this. So compressive sensing, the computer science way, plus a little bit of 4A analysis is going to lead to uh, sparse 4A transform algorithms. So I'll tell you what that means in a second. So the SFT, when I say SFT algorithms a lot in the future. So what are these? These are compressive sensing algorithms tuned to the Fourier basis that run in sublinear time. So in other words, the total number of samples and the runtime scales better than the number of basis elements that you want to try to perform your approximation in. Okay, so uh, and sort of the the specific way, there are many ways of coming up with these things. Uh, this specific formula that I'm going to sort of give you maybe has a distinction of allowing for entirely deterministic uh, algorithms with uh, near optimal um, uh, compressive sensing approximation theoretic guarantees. And also uh, allows you to take these things to uh, handle the, the multidimensional Fourier basis. So you can do things like approximation of functions of many variables in the Fourier basis very quickly with these types of methods. So a little bit about um, a little bit of bibliography here because I'm going to be woefully inadequate with respect to giving people the, the credit they deserve for the ideas that I'm going to be uh, doing here. So. Uh, if you want to see what a lot of what I'm talking about today and uh, tomorrow, where the where it comes from, you can Google the following terms. So these come from heavy hitters algorithms, uh, primarily. This is from the streaming algorithms literature. Okay, uh, in in computer science, um, you can also maybe find. Combinatorial compressive sensing as a as a keyword that'll bring some things up. 
and this this work is going to be my remixed version of songs originally composed by folks like uh, Mutu Mutu Krishnan. Um, there's uh, Martin Strauss, uh, Anna Gilbert. Um, who else? Uh, Graham Cormode. Uh, Piotr Indyk and a whole bunch of other folks that I am going to neglect saying many, many people, right? So I'm, I'm remixing ideas from this literature by a lot of these folks here. And what I mean by the, the 4A analysis methods, again, to sort of give credit where credit is due here, what I mean here, there are you know, these involve uh, ideas from une unequally spaced sparse for a transform techniques. So, um, and rank, uh, rank one lattice techniques for functions of high dimensions, uh, things like this. And you can read about uh, these types of ideas in uh, a nice book I'll reference later by uh, Daniel Potts. Um, other author, authors are uh, Steedle, Ash, Planka, Marilyn Planka um, as well. Uh, Vladimir Rocklin has worked a lot on, on this start type of stuff. Um, Dr. Rocklin being one of the influential unequally spaced sparse for a uh, uh, transform method we'll sort of interact with at least the ideas a little bit. Okay, so this is gonna be sort of what we're gonna be talking about the next couple of days. And then maybe the third day will be dedicated to sort of a second pseudo formula here, which is gonna be um, compressive sensing done the more traditional or mathematical way, I should say. So compressive sensing the math way. Um, plus uh, SFT is the computer science way, if you like. I'll say what I mean by that in a second. Are going to allow for uh, SFT techniques, so sparse approximation techniques that run in sublinear time for more general uh, orthonormal bases. Um, so SFT is for more general bases. Not too much more general, but um, at least uh, more general orthonormal uh, bases for functions of many variables. And you can also do compressive sensing with respect to using um, the following types of techniques. So here you can interact with things like the restricted isometry property for compressive sensing that matrices need to have in order to have success. Um, algorithms like COSAMP I'm going to focus on quite a bit by Needell and Trapp and uh, dimension incremental support identification ideas. Um, again, sort of by uh, Daniel Potts, Lutz Kammerer, and a bunch of uh, folks from that area. So these are, you know, Tao, Candes, Donahoe. Um, I feel like the uh, Throp and Nidell feel like I need to uh, reference these folks a little bit less. They're probably quite a bit better known to most people who are, who are in the room, right? And uh, computer, so sparse Fourier transforms the computer science way. What does that mean? Um, effectively, I consider this to be sort of Monte Carlo integration schemes that are sort of layered, which allow you to figure out which, uh, which basis elements have heavy coefficients, heavy Fourier coefficients. And that's a lot of what the sort of, again, uh, First sublinear time Fourier algorithms by people like Anna Gilbert again, uh, Martin Strauss, Piotr Indyk, and others are based on. And when you combine those ideas with sort of recognizing 
um, that the restricted isometry property lets you give uh, sort of construct uh, grids that allow for accurate Monte Carlo guarantees over entire function classes of sort of sparse signals. You can get the same types of deterministic guarantees and things like that for more general bases using these ideas and sort of mixing them together. So um, this is what I'm going to be talking about here. And uh, I should say that a lot of this stuff is going to be uh, summarized in the lecture notes that, uh, again, Craig and another graduate student of mine have written up that you can find on my website if you want to see some detailed proofs of things that I don't have time to do. So you can look at chapter six of um, a mathematical introduction. Uh, to fast and memory efficient ah six thank you yes that is the perfect type of question often my hand and brain don't communicate very well um yeah algorithms for big data And these are just lecture notes on my on my personal web page, which are riddled with errors, not not sourced properly at all. The references are need you know it needs a lot of work, uh, but nonetheless, the basic ideas about stuff are there, and perhaps it will continue to improve with time. Uh, should anyone be interested? Okay, good. So. Given this, uh, hopefully that's sort of background material for anything you're interested in learning a little bit more about. Um, and with that, maybe let's remind ourselves what compressive sensing is in the first place and sort of what the problem is that we can now talk about solving in the uh, computer science way to begin with. So, so compressive sensing maybe mainly as a as a means for me to uh, fix some notation, uh, make sure that we have some general sense of what I'm going to be writing on the board. All right, so I'm going to take a matrix M, which I will uncreatively, you know, call M because it's a matrix. It's going to be rectangular with many fewer rows than columns, and and I'm going to have some measurements of an arbitrary vector from this matrix and for some x that I want to try to recover from these measurements, right? So you want to, given this information, uh, recover x, right? So. I simply want to invert this linear system. It's pretty simple. Problem is um, M is much smaller than N, so I clearly can't do this. So we assume that we have some sort of sparsity. So since we can't do this in general, we are going to, uh, solve it for a restricted class of X, which are vectors that have a small number of non-zero entries, right? So in other words, I'll take this L zero norm and say it's less than or equal to S, where S is less than or equal to M, which is much smaller than M, right? Now I have a chance of being able to do this. Yep. Uh, X in CL, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, exactly. And okay, if, if X is exactly S sparse, that actually turns out to be a fairly easy thing to do. So what you more generally would, would like to do is to be able to do this for any approximately sparse function. So more generally, we will assume that uh, X is approximately as sparse. 
And then we have to define what that means, right? So let me fix some sort of common notation here to describe what that means. So probably you've seen this in, in some papers if you've read this stuff before. So I will work with respect to this uh, sigma one definition of the best S term approximation error for a given vector X. So S here is going to be an element of the set bracket N. And this is just my way of talking about integers uh, from zero to N minus one. That's supposed to be a Z. <laughs> Um, and X is whatever vector you're interested in um, yeah, in high dimensional space. And this is going to be defined then to be the, the minimum over all choices of subsets of N, where the cardinality of S, this is a subset S, is less than or equal to little s, so right of the one norm between x and x sub s. So what is x sub s? This is clearly going to be. So this is x restricted to s. I should say that's the set s. And okay, so what is this stuff? This is sort of what you might expect it to be. This is a vector whose jth entry is equal to the entry of X if J is in the set S and zero otherwise. So it's just a mask, right? We're zeroing out all the entries of X that aren't in S. So we go look. I should best, that should probably be in minimum instead of a minimum, but uh, or maybe anyways, right? You uh, go ahead and look for all of the best possible approximations, just picking out a small number of entries, and that's the, the minimum error that you can get for this particular vector. Okay. Hey, so, Mark. Um, oh, hi. Uh, it's Ben. Ben Adcock here, uh, remotely. Should it be small s on the left uh, rather than big S? Uh, this is on the left. This is this is a small s. Sorry, yeah. I probably shouldn't have used two s's. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, my resolution is not good. So uh, yeah, it's yep. Uh, yep. that yep. is small Thank s. Thank you. Thank you for uh, getting my notation straightened out. Please continue. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So and uh, so another definition that I won't uh, define the uh, 100% here, but for small s again, I'm just going to sort of wave my hands a little bit and use uh, x little s to be any minimizer which achieves this error. So this is a sparse um, version of x. So this is going to be equal to x restricted for some subset which I could call maybe S opt. There could be more than one sub subset. Order them in some way that you like and pick the first one in your order, right? Um, such that you actually achieve this, this uh, worst case error. So I'm gonna use both of these. Oh, this is again, little s. This is now little s. It's a best s term approximation to x. I just don't want to have to carry around sets too often. So I'm going to sort of use this uh, as a way to avoid having to do that. Okay. So other things you can do, right? You can exchange the one with some other P norm and change the definition up here if you want. Uh, we're going to work with, with the one norm primarily. So, so the, 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 the second definition that could be very many vectors, right? I mean, isn't that just the argument set? Uh, it, it could be so we'll so go ahead and uh, take all the sets in the power set of n whose cardinality is smaller than s less than or equal to s order them any way you want lexicographically or something. 
it's a finite set. Um, and then take the first one that, that achieves this. So there could be more than one, but we just need one. Okay. Okay. And so all of our error guarantees are gonna be with respect to, to this guy. And then, you know, that's just an irritation that makes proving things a little bit more annoying to realize that there, it, it isn't necessarily unique. This guy is, this guy is a unique. minimizer of that. Problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just you fix it by fixing some order on these. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So okay. this guy will be unique, but it sort of doesn't matter in the error guarantees that I'll show you. So that isn't something that like makes everything false because I'm dumb. I probably did something else to make things false because I'm dumb, but not that anyways. Uh, yeah, no, good question. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Good. So, uh, speaking of which, here are some questions that we have to answer. Okay, so two main things that we have to answer. Um, so, for the class of, of X, where uh, this best S term approximation error is meaningfully small, because if it's too large, right, you could potentially get anything and then you can't expect very much. So, where X is approximately sparse, uh, when can you do inversion accurately, either exactly if it's exactly uh, as sparse or um, uh, still accurately if it's almost as sparse. So what type of M are we going to consider? That let us do this. And we sort of have answers to this that you probably a lot of you know. So I'm going to fake uh, focus. Um, And I'll be a little bit more explicit here. So that let us invert our measurements, right? Um, when, again, being highly, uh, highly non-rigorous non when X is approximately sparse. <laughs> so I'll put it that way. Um, so what, what type of matrices let us do this fast? That's what we're going to need eventually in order to get the sublinear time behavior. So then it's going to be a little bit uh, different and a little bit less complete answer than what you're used to from the compressive sensing world uh, generally. And so when inversion is possible, uh, what are the algorithms that actually let you do this, right? So you need to know what good algorithms exist that you can implement quickly that take your measurements and spit out a good uh, approximation to a vector in CN by just uh, listing the most important entries, right? If you want this to run faster than n time, you can't output an entire vector. So we're gonna always be outputting a set of entries and then coefficients, right? Sort of operating that mode. Um, but when represented as a big vector, it should be uh, high quality, which means which means in particular in this case that I want to get compressive uh, sensing type error guarantees that are sort of near, uh, near optimal. So uh, the, the algorithm that I'm going to talk about here gives you, and I'll give you some more details on this, sort of what you want. So you input your measurements into some um, algorithm A, and it very rapidly outputs an approximation to the original vector X, which in the two norm is gonna be less than this best approximation error with respect to the one norm divided by the square root of S times some um, constant, which uh, you can spend time figuring out a, a universal count, you know, bound for. Yep. Uh, Mark, so in your measurement model, there's no noise. So is that for notational convenience? Make the presentation easy, or because, like, or it could be done with noise, or not? I, I'll give you a theorem that involves noise okay. later. This is mainly just to sort of point out that in the noiseless case, so no noise on the measurements. In other words, that you you do want the sort of performance that you would yeah. generally prove for like a basis pursuit type method or something like that. Okay. Okay. The punishment that you're going to see here is that um, uh, we're going to end up using more measurements than basis pursuit would use. You, there's generally no free lunch. So we're gonna use a more structured set of measurements 
that ends up being larger than the smallest set of measurements that would work for basis pursuit. And then we're gonna use those extra samples to radically speed up the, the runtime of the method. That's sort of what, what the general formula is here. All right. Wow. I am going, I have way more notes than I need or something. All right, good. All right. So let me go ahead and answer this first question right here um, about what type of, uh, what type of X I can use or what type of matrix I can use. So here's an answer to question one. This is in no means the only answer. I would be interested in better answers. So um, you can use a sort of matrix with a restricted type of coherence guarantee to make all of this stuff work ultimately. So everything we talk about here is gonna be based on choosing a couple integers from our bracket n set again. And I'm then gonna want a matrix M, right, M by N. So I want to have a small number of rows as usual. And I want it to have something that I'll call K alpha coherence. So, and it's going to have this property if two things hold. So first of all, uh, every column of M has to have at least K ones in it. And so let me specify this a little bit more. I'm going to make this highly highly restricted. In fact, these are gonna be matrices of zeros and ones. So let me not obscure that fact, right? Um, so I'm gonna need a matrix of zeros and ones where every column has at least K ones in it. So I have to have some ones in every column, in fact, a potentially large number. And I need to pack them in there very carefully because I also want to have all of the column inner products to be small. So bounded by this alpha parameter. So also I'm gonna need that the J and L row of M are always less than or equal to alpha um, whenever L is not equal to J. And this notation is, this is the jth column of my matrix. All right. So, um, and what we're gonna see is that for any matrix like this, that has this highly, I mean, pretty, pretty structured setup, there's gonna be a sublinear time inversion algorithm for anything like this. Okay, so that's one thing we can say. So there's a, sublinear time recovery algorithm, uh, sort of answering this question and I'll write, write it down. There's one, at least one, that does uh, number two right over here for, uh, for any such K alpha coherent M. Okay, so that's sort of what we want to uh, see next. And I'm, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what the reconstruction algorithm is, and then uh, I'll talk about why it works for a while afterwards. So we'll get to the, the punchline sort of quickly. So before I can tell you what the algorithm looks like though, um, I need to have one little definition of another sub matrix of any such M that uh, that's going to show up in the algorithm, and then that's it. Otherwise, the algorithm is really easy. Yep. Can I just uh, ask a more general question that I sometimes don't understand in complex statistics? The matrix M, how much like do you get to choose M, or how much is it given? Is the question clear? In the, in this case, we're going to be designed. These M are going to have to have a lot loads of structure. We're going to have to design these guys. I think it would be highly. Um, it would be highly odd that you would accidentally get an M like this that happens to work. However, uh, probably tomorrow you'll see that 
you can design M like this that work really well with, with uh, respect to sparsity and the Fourier basis that are very natural. And that sort of lead to natural types of grids that you might want to use for, you know, uh, doing approximation with respect to trigonometric polynomials. So um, tons of implied structure, but it interacts nicely with some really important bases and lets nice things happen. So we'll, there is a reason to continue following the structure, I guess. Yeah. Uh, when you write so linear time algo that does need to do, do you mean like it answers questions to you, like it'll bake that down? Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And so it it'll have this type of error guarantee and it'll run in some linear time. Yep, perfect. Okay. I like the questions. Keep keep me honest. <laughs> or at least <laughs> lying well. Yeah. Another a quick one. So the coherence usually okay, now you're in zero one. Uh, to the n times n. Usually, like there's an assumption like the columns are L2 normalized. So it, it normalization here, okay, of course. You'll have to normalize uh, later. Okay. It yeah. Be, okay. So the actual, the actual, um, yeah, you'll end up sort of implicitly normalizing later. Okay. Uh, yeah. See, I told you no optimization. <laughs> okay. You can, I'll turn around, you can sneak out while I'm writing on the board. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, so let me, let me define one more thing and then I'll sort of write down, uh, write down what this algorithm is and it's super simple. So if you don't understand what the algorithm means, it's because I've done a bad job and you should make me do a better job. Okay, so, um, so um, if, I have some matrix with zeros and ones. Uh, that's that's uh, K alpha coherent, or maybe not. I suppose it doesn't even matter. Um, and you give me some choice of n that you're interested in. So one of the one of the a number from the column index. Okay. Um, then I'm gonna have to talk about at least a little, a little bit about a sub matrix of M called uh, M operating on N, I'll just call it this. So what is this? This is a, a uh, K by N matrix. So I guess we do want M to have at least K ones in every column. You'll see in a second when I define this. So not just this, but it should be K alpha coherent, I suppose, or at least have enough ones in every column. So this is uh, this is the first capital K rows of M um, containing a one in the nth column. Okay, so, um, so every column has at least K ones. So for the nth one, you look in that column, find the, the first K rows with a one in it, pull out those rows, that's your sub matrix. Okay, so um, what that means, so I'll put it over here. Pictorially, what this matrix is always gonna look like, and that's part of why this, algorithm I'm about to write down works. Is it is going to be right still a long matrix, the nth column is going to be the ones vector, right? So this is just the vector of all ones. And then all of here, it's gonna be very sparse. So a lot of zeros. And why is that? Um, there are gonna be a lot of zeros there because if I look in this column, right, the inner product of these two columns has to be small. Uh, so, um, and all the entries are positive. In fact, zero and one, so there can be at most alpha ones in this column or else I would have broken my inner product condition over here. This is a sub matrix of the original matrix, right? So there can't be 
Uh, there can't be too many ones in any of these columns is sort of what you get from this coherence condition, right? So that's what this sub matrix has to look like. So it's gonna sort of drive um, why this uh, simple algorithm is gonna work that I'm gonna write down here. All right, so let me go ahead. And this is a, this is a heavy hitters algorithm effectively from the, from the uh, computer science universe, more or less, right? So I'll call this uh, median recovery. So this is my answer to the second problem. And this is gonna be an algorithm if you wanna write it as a function, I guess, right? It is going to take a set of measurements. It'll take, a, this is the power set. It's gonna take a support set where you think the most important entries are. The support set could be, um, could be all of the potential entries, right? In other words, you supplied no additional information. This just gives you the possibility of making your life a little easier. So this is a subset of that. These are our measurements. We're going to need our matrix. It has a low, low coherence. And given this information, we'll then output some good approximation that satisfies the type of error guarantee that we saw before. Okay, so that's what this guy is. So given, all right, M X, which means I'm also assuming we actually know what M is, some subset capital S of N and a sparsity that's it at most uh, half of the cardinality of, of uh, this set S. Otherwise you don't have anything to do, right? Because apparently you know where the support is already. Um, so what we're gonna do, it's super simple. For each end of our potential support set, we're gonna go ahead and estimate a coefficient. In the following uh, sort of ridiculous way. So I'm going to just take, um, I'm going to estimate the real part of the nth coefficient of, of the vector in, at, at uh, position n, okay, by simply taking the median of the entries of the real part of the sub matrix that has ones in the nth column times times x, right? So this vector. I have those because I, right, this is just a sub matrix of the original M, so I can find where those are and do this median. I'll do the same thing for the imaginary parts. Okay, those are going to give me my my uh, entries. Okay, when I'm when I'm done doing that, I'm then just going to sort my coefficients that I've estimated by magnitude. So I have those, so I can sort my estimates. by magnitude, and then I'm going to take the corresponding entries and their ends that I've estimated and output those as my sparse approximation. So, all right, so maybe I'll give some sort of notation here, right? So ZN1 is gonna be the largest one, ZN2 will be the next largest one all the way. Um, so I'll take, uh, S tilde, that's my approximate support to be the, the associated entries that were largest down to 2S or however, however num number I have. If, I guess if this is, uh, if this is less than S, you can just output them all, right? And then, then I'll go ahead and output 
z restricted to s tilde as a compact version of, of my approximation. So, and this is going to be my estimate. And I claim that it's going to be uh, compressive sensing error guarantee accurate. Okay, so um, any questions about this stuff? So intuitively, maybe why this should this work? Um, all of the entries of this, if you think about what they look like due to this sort of structure, they're going to look like um, xn because we're measuring, we're measuring the ent uh, entry of xn with all of these guys plus some little uh, some little entries here from this very sparse other set of columns that's hitting other weird entries of X and sort of averaging them in a bunch of strange subsets. And so you're going to argue eventually that most of these epsilons are going to be small compared to the, op to the optimal error that you're interested in because of the highly structured nature of this M is sort of how the argument goes. Um, and it takes, it takes some, some thinking to see this. I'm not saying it's, it's obvious, but that's sort of why this thing ends up working. Um, the proof is in those poorly cited notes that I, uh, of the following theorem is in the poorly cited notes that I mentioned before. So let me, let me just give you maybe the, so I see what time it is. Um, what you can prove about this. Yep. Is there any sort of like relative, is there like a relationship between like what K and alpha need to be? Like if alpha is like a lot larger than K, does that maybe like mess with the sparsity? Uh, alpha a lot larger than K is going to be bad. So effectively, and well, sort of tell you actually in this theorem what, what you end up needing here, but basically you really want to have K a lot bigger than alpha because that's going to be something that corresponds to a non-trivially sort of incoherent matrix. Um, and that's why it's hard, because you need to pack. You want to have a small number of, of measurements. So M should be small. You don't want to just make M huge, because then you sort of failed. So with a constrained M size, you want to pack in as many ones as you possibly can, subject to not overlapping in any pair of columns, any of them enough to get this coherence bound to break. So this is, uh, these are, uh, these take thought to, and I'll show you how to, how to build some things like this. It takes some thought of things like the Chinese remainder theorem to be able to come up with examples of why, how you can do this. And once you see a couple, you actually realize that there's, an, there's an, a vast literature of constructions for you already. So you can open up your favorite error correcting codes book and you'll find about a hundred matrices that do this for you. These turn out to be error correcting, linear error correcting code matrices give you these things. So I'll mention that a little, little while too. So there are many examples. It's not like there's, there's this one. Yep. Uh, just a minor notation. So the cardinality of S tilde, is it alpha S or 2S? Uh, it's 2S. 2S, okay. Just for a sort of technical reasons, I guess. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Any other? Questions, intuition type things. Okay, so let me sort of give you an accuracy theorem, uh, which will also tell you how large you want K to be and related to alpha and some other stuff like that. Here. All right, so um, here's a theorem you can find in those notes. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit more complicated than it has to be, but not too bad. So I'm gonna let you pick some positive number bigger than one, it's a parameter. Uh, you got to stick, pick a sparsity that's little s from your, your set here. Um, you're going to have your vector that you hope is sparse x and uh, for Simone for planted. Thank you for planting that question. You get some measurement noise you get to add on to your 
<laughs> to your measurements. Okay. And uh, then you need a good measurement matrix. So we will take our highly structured zero one matrix and force it to be four alpha s plus one alpha uh, coherent. Right, so now you see that K is quite a bit bigger than alpha, um, right? Um, and you have to assume, this is crucial, uh, that you have input a set S that actually contains useful information about the vector X. And a lot of what we talk about next is gonna be how to find such a set quickly. It turns out to be the hardest thing. So the set S that we input over here has to be informative. So in particular, we'll say that it, can say it contains the set of heavy elements or heavy entries. Okay, that's gonna have a bunch of parameters dec decorating it, but um, C S beta. Okay, so what does this mean? This, these are gonna be entries of X whose magnitudes uh, of the associated entries are bigger than beta times this best S term approximation error of X with respect to S divided by S plus the infinity norm of N say. Okay, so you need to be able to guarantee that you found me or included all of the things in S that are bigger than some averaged version of your best S term approximation error plus uh, the worst sort of extra noise that you've dumped into any particular place. So if you can guarantee me that the set you've given me at least contains those important elements, then this this median uh, reconstruction algorithm that takes noisy entries of measurements of X, right? The measurement matrix, this set S and your sparsity. Is that what I asked for? I think I, oh, yeah. Or I think I said M, whatever, right? So this, this guy, um, it's going to output this vector z, and it's going to be less than some constant, some absolute constant that depends on b times the best s term approximation error divided by the in the one norm divided by the square root of s. Thank you. Plus the square root of s times the infinity norm of n. All right. And if you really want, you can bound this absolute constant by something. I'll just put it there because it's here. All right. So it's gonna be less than this particular number for whatever choice of beta you came up with. Okay. Um, so what does this mumbo jumbo mean? In particular, you can just think of it this way. If you give me the entire set of entries, so I'm going to estimate all of them and then just output the biggest two S estimates that I get, then um, this heavy element set is automatically satisfied because I gave you everything. It certainly includes these entries, right? This is a subset of N, of bracket N. So you'll, you'll achieve this best S term approximation error that I promised you when you don't have any measurement noise. So that's one way of looking at it. If, however, you have some clever way of finding a superset that's not too big of these important entries that satisfy this, this condition, then you only have to estimate those important entries, which is going to be faster than n time, because there are a smaller number of them. And you've done all everything you have to do, so you still get this error guarantee that you want. Right? So that's the dynamic tension that we're playing with here. So the the real goal 
is going to be uh, to talk about next um, how to find this sort of set of heavy elements more quickly and then employ this median recovery magnitude estimation procedure to just get their coefficients and then call your call your life good. Okay, so just as sort of a runtime note, um, the runtime of this thing, if you run through it, is going to be order of your superset size. So we want to have a small set S times the maximum of K and log of the cardinality of S. Right, so uh, why is this? Well, this, this is finding a median, so you can do this in order k time with a fast median method. Or at least you can believe if you use a, a more easy one, you can sort these and do it in k log k time, right? That is assuming, and this is crucial, that I can find the submatrix in order k time. So we have to be able to do that as well. So if, and then uh, can be found or generated in order k time for any particular um, uh, for any particular matrix M, any column of this guy, I should say. If any column of this guy. Okay, so I figure out where the rows are, where there are ones in the nth column. I have to be able to do that quickly. I form this, I do the median. That's at, at worst sorting time for these guys. Then I have, uh, I have my S of these estimates. I sort them, that's S log S time, cardinality of S log cardinality time. Um, pick out the largest one, spit out the answers, I'm done, right? So. Point is, if I have the luxury of putting in a small s, I have a sublinear time algorithm just from this thing. Uh, review which of these constants are God given and which are which you choose and which come from the problem. This is uh, yeah. This is this is user choice. This is sparsity. It's user choice, I guess. Um, X is God given. N is God given. And you don't have any control of your noise. Um, then uh, the S is containing this, I guess, as a God-given condition. Um, it depends on things you don't know, but you can estimate quickly, maybe. Um, is it clear how you can pick like the smallest or like small in some sense that, that first, that's what you want, right? Yeah, you want a small s. Yeah, so we'll talk a lot about how to estimate this guy. In terms of how big this set can be, um, you can, uh, this set can be, you can work out that there are at most two s elements in here. It can never have more than two s elements in this guy. So roughly, why does that work? So this only makes things worse because it makes there be potentially fewer elements. So let's ignore the noise for a moment. Um, here, uh, if you remove the S largest entries of X, which you sort of have no control over, um, the resulting uh, size of what's left is gonna be the best S term approximation error. And then if there are more things, uh, more than S remaining guys who are bigger than that error divided by S, then you would violate the fact that you had a best S term approximation error of that size. So this, the cardinality of this guy, uh, this doesn't tell you how to find it, but it does tell you that there are most two S of these guys for any of these parameter choices. So there aren't too many large entries that you need to identify. This set could be empty, and then that tells you basically that this is a bad sparse approximation problem for these parameters and anything you output is basically gonna suck. So you can output basically anything and you'll be fine. So if it's the empty set, it means hope you have a hopeless problem for that parameter choice of S. 
There is no good sparse approximation. Yep. Do you choose alpha or is that provided in some way? Um, alpha is uh, something that alpha is sort of a free parameter here. Um, you basically want to come up with an alpha that minimizes M subject to this condition being true. And so we'll sort of see what you can get away with with respect to alpha a little later. So it's kind of free at this point. But um, you know, the, the realities of error correcting codes mean that there are only so many you know, things you can do trying to minimize M well with your choices of alpha that make sense. Because also, you know, there's also feedback. If you make alpha really big, then K gets bigger, and clearly M has to get bigger. So, you know, there's <laughs> there's some feedback there. Um, good. Do I have any time left uh, at all? Yeah. Two minutes. Okay. So maybe I will. Any other questions about this about this theorem before I sort of cover it over with another? board yeah it's not meant to uh it's meant to sort of introduce you to some notion of of heavy elements yep uh, could you clarify how we choose the capital s again oh yeah um i i haven't told you anything about that oh, okay. i'll yeah i'll so you don't have to know all i'm saying is you can you can choose it if you want to be all of n and then you have an n log n time method, right? Like FFT time. So it's still pretty fast. And this is automatically, this condition is automatically satisfied. So you can always do that. The whole trick to sublinear time algorithms going forward is going to be telling you how to do something smarter than that quickly. <laughs> that you have identified the entire problem. Um, and the, the general notion, the general thing you're gonna, we're going to end up doing is using more samples, more, more measurements that let us figure out what a good S is. So our measurement setup is going to get even more structured and, and terrible than it currently is. But the result will let us uh, determine a superset of this set uh, really fast. And so that's what we'll sort of talk about next. Um, Good. Any other questions? So I'm I've effectively run out of time. I mean, it, we can think of it now if, if you want to add something maybe. quick that it makes sense to add now. Or maybe yeah, maybe, uh, maybe. Let me just um, add. Well, um, yeah, we could take a break now. Uh, and then I'll sort of start here next time. It's okay. okay. I'm covering a little less of my notes than I thought I might, but it's okay. <laughs>